Hi, and welcome to Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. Well, some of you may wonder, well, how do we get guests for the show? Well, in this case here, our guest uh, who's joining us today, Emery Roth II, actually uh, was courtesy of a neighbor of mine who uh, actually met Emery while uh, photographing uh, the old uh, Collinsville, Connecticut Axe Factory uh, and uh, thought of me and said, wow, this guy might make a good guest for Larry's show. So then one thing led to another. Uh, Emery Roth uh, and I met at a... Uh, uh, a, uh, a book talk, book signing up in Winstead, Connecticut. He was there with uh, uh, the well-known uh, uh, politician and um, uh, consumer advocate, uh, Ralph Nader. And uh, one thing led to another, and here uh, he is on the program. Uh, Emery uh, is the author of a new book, uh, Brass Valley, The Fall of an American Industry. And uh, after 40 years living and teaching in Connecticut's Northwest Hills, uh, Emory became fascinated with the old mill towns of the Naugatuck Valley and their history. And he began following the tracks through uh, old ruins until he was led to the last functioning brass mill at that time. Um, again, for uh, the last several years, he's been photographing uh, the men at work, traveling back in time. Uh, I know as someone who's lived in Connecticut all my life, I was uh, duly impressed at uh, uh, some of the stories that he's going to share with us, and more importantly, the stories uh, that come out as a result of the photographs. Uh, the book is published by uh, Schiffer Books, and uh, we welcome to Studio 411, Amory Roth II, who uh, always tells me me, call him Ted. So Ted, I will just so that you don't think I'm talking to his brother. So Emery, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, before we do this, I know I was uh, uh, in the midst of my research, and then I also confirmed it uh, with your lovely wife, Jane. Now, you are the second because uh, apparently, uh, as my research told me, your, your grandfather uh, was, uh, was quite a uh, well-known person in his day. And uh, just tell us a little bit about Emery Roth. My grandfather was an immigrant from Hungary who came alone at the age of 13, found himself by the time he was beginning a career in architecture in 1893 in White City in Chicago, the great World's Fair that was held there. And that was the beginning of a career that led him to build apartment houses in New York City that are today famous. And uh, some of them are quite uh, well known. Give us a sampling of some of the ones that he would be known well, for. Well, the Beresford, the San Remo, the Ritz Tower. Um, when I was growing up in New York City, I remember going to the planetarium and looking around. As the lights dimmed, you saw the uh, skyline of Central Park. And the Central Park West, those buildings made the skyline. There you go. So I wanted to toss that in because I was impressed. And I thought, here was your, your grandfather, of course, you know, a, a, a well-known architect, and then I thought, okay, now you did study architecture, but I did, uh, and my f father and my brother were architects. Yeah. My father was the architect with Minoru Yamasaki of the World Trade Center. There you go. And then uh, um, again, while obviously your training is in in that field as well, I find it interesting that you have through your uh, photographic skills, uh, kind of taking it to another level. You photograph uh, images that we're going to see certainly today on the program that, again, just um, uh, even though they're factory based, I, I still find some of the architecture and design fascinating because uh, the stuff today to me sometimes pales in comparison to the way some of these structures were put together. Even Things, though, even though we're viewing them in, in rather decaying condition at times, but still, factories today are built to be replaceable, yeah. to be torn down. Back then, they were built built to be monuments. There you go. Um, now, where did the idea from the the book come about? Obviously, we talked a little bit about you know you, you had lived in the area. You're not originally from Connecticut, but uh, you kind of what what led to several years ago then you undertaking this this uh, this journey? I've always been fascinated by what I call time travel, carrying myself back through looking at the cities and the the places around me to different periods. And when I retired from teaching, I began photographing the old hill farms, and eventually. I heard about the Naugatuck Valley and decided I ought to find out what this neighboring valley was all about to where I lived and um, began exploring what was then mostly ruins. And most people told me that at the time, you're too late. It's all gone. 
and a miracle led me to the last working brass mill in the valley. There you go. Um, now, how long of a process um, from start to finish, from the time you said, look, I, I think I've got an idea for, for a book here, uh, from that point until it finally was released, uh, how long of a period are we talking about? I, th I began photographing in the working mill in 2011. The mill closed in December of 2013, and by then the book was written in a rough draft format and ready to submit to a publisher. Um, I think very quickly after I found myself in that mill, I, I said, I'm looking at machines that were built at the beginning of the 20th century that are still in use, that are doing incredible things, and men working, and this is a unique experience, and others need to see what went on here sure. and understand its cultural roots and how it is the basis of the, the culture that we live in, the society we live in. Uh, well, tell uh, uh, us all, again, what is Brass Valley? Because again, as a lifelong Connecticut resident, I, I was not familiar with the term, so I and, think many are not as well. And Brass Valley is actually a phrase that's, that's almost disappeared. Even when I go down into the valley, there are a lot of people who've never heard that phrase. But it used to be known that the Naugatuck River Valley from, from Shelton up to Winstead was where the world's brass parts were made in an age of steam and electricity and all the things that needed brass before there were plastics. That's where it was made, and they shipped their products around the world. And it was not only the brass industry, but it was all sorts of industries that, that needed brass parts, clocks and bicycles and watches and, and sewing machines and pianos, and I could go on. Um, the, the story of, of, again, this whole adventure, uh, uh, again, in terms of the manufacturing, the mills, again, goes all the way back to 1802. And again, some of this, obviously, that I researched, but some mm -hmm. of it, too, I had the pleasure, as I said mm -hmm. earlier, of attending your, your book slide presentation. And it was, I sat there, and, and I almost felt like I was back in school. You know, it was amazing to sit there with the other audience members, and I was learning things and seeing some of these images that we're going to look at today, again, a very small sampling of, of the uh, probably hundreds of photographs that uh, were taken in order to put this, uh, this project thousands. together. Thousands, yeah. Um, again, just to, you know, take us through again, uh, going back to 1802, I know there were a couple of, uh, couple of gentlemen very industrious in their day that, that kind of uh, helped uh, put well, Grass Valley on the map. Abel Porter is the one who is credited as pouring the first brass. And of course, back then, it was um, uh, brass was very much valued for all kinds of things, but nobody in this country knew how to do the process, how to make it. And um, he began working on that in 1802 on South Main Street in Waterbury. Um, he set up a brass mill there in order to, um, he, he poured the metal into ingots, and he needed to roll them out, but he had no rolling mill in the valley. And so in order to roll those mills, they had to be trucked up the old dirt roads to um, um, the hills to a town near Litchfield called Bradleyville, which I learned I lived down the street from. We call it Bantam today, where there was a, the iron industry had a rolling mill. And so part of the brass industry is the whole beginning of metals and metalworking and machinists in, in Connecticut. And Connecticut was a big leader in that. And once they'd rolled those, those um, ingots out flat, they then had to be taken by wagon on dirt roads that washed out back down into the valley where they did the finishing, finished rolling, and then they stamped out buttons. And when they were all done, the people looked at the buttons and they said they were as pale as if they'd been gilded with dandelion water. And uh, they continued buying British brass buttons, even though um, we weren't always good friends with England. Right, in those days, absolutely. Uh, again, we'll jump to some of these photographs as we go through the hour. Uh, tell us uh, where this, uh, this was taken. 
this is um, in Ansonia. This is the, um, um, locals call it the sand elevator. It used to have a great trestle in front of it that brought trains up the front. And the um, bridge behind it crosses over the track and crosses over three um, sheds of the Fowl Machine Company, which was one of the great machine companies of the valley, still is, and um, to their um, um, uh, foundry, which uh, I'm told was the largest foundry in New England for machine parts. They made the great uh, rolls that were used for rolling rubber or plastic later or uh, paper or all kinds of things. Any industry that needed to have big rolls, they made the biggest. Gotcha. They knew how to do it. They had a special technology. The other thing too, uh, again, there's so many things to look at. I'll comment and correct me if, if I'm uh, incorrect on this, is that in some of the images that we're going to see, um, again, things look in somewhat disrepair or decay, other than perhaps the, the one mill that you had a chance to uh, spend time at before they closed. Again, some of that I came to deduce was actually probably because of vandalism, graffiti, once these buildings were no longer occupied. Uh, as, as I think many people know, again, uh, people uh, will, will go into some of these abandoned buildings for uh, either copper, which again is very hot commodity on the, the black market, we'll say, as well as, you know, strip, uh, strip sometimes buildings of every, every metal piece that they have, whether it's copper or not. So just to keep that in mind, that I kind of deduce that for myself, that as you see some of these images, the conditions while probably are not the greatest in terms of even 20th century style, uh, probably look worse only because of the damage and decay that had existed. There are a lot of people <laughs> photographing in the ruins and my friend and I began by shooting in a lot of the old abandoned factories and shooting, one of the reasons that the book was important to me is because it changed my whole view of what those buildings were and, and what they meant. And now when I go into those abandoned buildings I see them as they once were sure. with, with bustling with activity and producing things. Talk a little bit about this because this kind of ties in with, you know, people just didn't go to work for 24 hours a day. Obviously, people set up a shop in more ways than one. They had lives, they raised families, uh, there was no Route 8 as we know it today, as you mentioned before, dirt roads, you know, gravel roads. So again, we had a photo here of the, uh, I believe, the uh, old Ansonia Opera House. Yes. And of course, it's a wonderful structure. It's just a shame that it hasn't been resurrected like Absolutely. so many others. Absolutely. It's, a, it's an, an 1870 Opera House. Think about the fact that Ansonia was founded in about 1846, 47. By 1870, they needed a meeting place, and this is what they built. And they called it an opera house to be make it respectable. But it served the country, it served Ansonia from then until well into the 50s. Now another another town, again, I haven't spent a lot of time there, but mm -hmm. I do go by there once in a while, is Thomaston. Mm -hmm. You have, um, we may have a shot, I, I can't recall offhand, but we're obviously in any communities, again, not just in Connecticut, but Pennsylvania, you know, whether it was Allentown, the mining era, you know, anything where there was uh, uh, manufacturing, business, jobs of any kind, communities sprung up and they were they were there. And, and in Thomaston you have, again, another, uh, type of opera house, correct? Which is Absolutely. Still, is by the same architect, the by same, the way. Okay. Um, still thriving, and there was a wonderful shot that I saw in, in somewhere in the book where there was um, obviously the uh, Episcopal and Catholic churches were next door or close well, to that's the area. In, that's in, in Derby, the in, Birmingham in Derby, section yeah. of Derby, and there was there is the uh, Sterling Opera House, another beautiful old building with supposedly remarkable acoustics that... Uh, is sitting waiting for restoration and right. use. Both of these buildings, I think, could could bring such interest to the lower valley. Maybe if we all chip in, we can we can absolutely. <laughs> going to take going to take a few dollars to uh, to bring it back to life Could've in more ways than one. Television studio. There, there. you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, it could be studio four one one central. I can see it now. Uh, again, this shot here. Tell us a little that bit is, about this. That is the Fowl Foundry. That's what we talked about before, and that was supposedly the largest foundry in New England. And when I was there, of course, it had been closed for a number of years. They were removed 
removing things that had been stored there, and they let us go in and photograph. Um, ex exceedingly dangerous place. We wore hard hats. We were very careful not to back up because there were deep pits that you could fall into everywhere. The ceiling was falling down. Uh, but mention it was an mention place. Uh, 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 a fellow uh, photographer, uh, uh, Laszlo. Laszlo Kiyosak was yeah. is my good friend, and and he and I undertook this project together. Um, we are working on a second book together right now. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, there's a term mentioned in the book, and I think obviously uh, pretty self-evident. You refer to uh, uh, these uh, uh, structures, whatever, or the, the process of industrial decay. Uh, kind of expound on, on what, what that term means as, as we talk about these structures. Well, I, I'm not sure what you're getting at. I have referred to them as industrial cathedrals okay. because to me they are, they represent what built this country and built a culture in which management and labor and government all developed rules that they could live by, built a culture that we all live be within and um, very much come to the fore in our election this year. There was, uh, again, another point I wanted to bring up, too, that as a kid growing up in, in the Bridgeport area, Fairfield County, you know, of course, to us, you know, as kids, you know, Waterbury, Danbury, Hartford certainly was like, like you know, a, a million miles away. But then, you know, as an adult now, as I travel, you know, the, the modern highway Route 8 that we know and, and sometimes love, you know, it strikes me that I always think, geez, we have these, these railroad tracks that never seem to be used. I know they're used for maybe some some t guided tours and things like that. And then uh, I think there was a, um, a phrase that there are, uh, I forget how many uh, miles and miles of tracks, many of which Absolutely. certainly like these here, that are totally unused. And it just. This one is actually used. It is used. This okay. is, this yeah, is I had to pick the one. That's the single <laughs> line up the Naugatuck Valley. Uh, the trains, commuter trains, run as far as Waterbury today, but they used to go all the way up to Winstead. Um, in doing your uh, research and, and eventually work, um, you did, even with some of the uh, semi-abandoned structures, mm -hmm. as well as uh, maybe maybe more with those than the, than the ones Not that semi were semi-abandoned, very abandoned. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be uh, nice here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you met with some resistance because it was almost like you would think you were trying to photograph, like you know, Fort Knox or the CIA building. Uh, that sometimes you were was it because of concerns for your safety, or they did not not want someone to photograph these, in some cases, ruins like we're looking at here? Or what was the hesitation on some people sometimes to give you access to these, these buildings? Um, the ones that, that were difficult to get in were, were buildings that people cared about. And yes, they were concerned with the safety and uh, with our safety going in because they are dangerous places. They have all kinds of uh, pollutants in them. They have things falling, as I said, and places where you can fall into. Um, in uh, one particular factory we went into, the metal thieves had re removed all the manhole covers. So you could be walking along even inside a building and there'd be this deep pit that went down beyond where wow. you could see. And, and given that they yeah. were they were dark and, and in some cases obviously uh, people don't realize that so many of these buildings because of the chemicals and the corrosives again such as uh, residue from this type of material that's why a lot of these buildings tend to go up quickly when when a yes. fire is started because again these floors are soaked you know uh, w with so many years and years of, of uh, chemicals however I have to say working in the working mill photographing in the working mill was at least as dangerous sometimes more so particularly the foundry and I have to give John Bardo a lot of credit who was the president of the company who saw that we were responsible and professional and knew what we were doing and um, he um, um, made sure 
he, he gave us access for, I mean, we're still shooting on those properties even as they demolish them, but for the right. three years they were working and three years since um, he's let us photograph there. There you go. Uh, tell a little bit about this. I know this was kind of like almost a promotional shot that was, was kind of to show well, some is, of the work that's done well. It's gone now. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll go to here. Besides being a uh, photo of our guest, Emery Roth II, Ted, uh, obviously you see some of the lovely, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, blown up images of some of your artwork. This looks like this might have been at, at some show, sort of uh, art that show. That was at an again. exhibit, yes. Yeah, exhibit. I think so. that was uh, either the Washington Art Association or an exhibit recently in Roxbury, I don't gotcha. recall. Well, we'll jump to this one. If uh, Jay and our crew in the uh, in the in the shop here can get a shot of uh, this uh, this uh, uh, image right here, which again I think Emery can see. This is one where again, I can see it. It's marvelous. Again, just the you know the colors that are bouncing off. I'm not quite sure what's going on there, other than there's well, some serious you. serious work going on there. But there are what continues not only in the valley but throughout. Connecticut and New England is a lot of small machine shops that do um, custom jobs. And what Andrew is doing there is he is taking old train wheels and he's put that have worn out and he's putting new metal on them because it's more um, uh, it saves money to restore the old wheel rather than making new ones. So he had about 50 old train wheels there and he was going through carefully um, welding metal to the wheels so that it could be reused again. And if we can go to this shot here in the center, if we can hold it on there, I want to show you, again, in the book, you talk about, again, obviously, uh, the images that you took. Some you took in black and white, others you took in color. If we can stay on that shot, and actually I'll change uh, another thing over here. Did you see how now that changed? Now, again, why the um, uh, kind of uh, switching between the color and the black and white? I mean, obviously, it's like color in black and white movies. You know, they always say, Citizen Kane would have never worked as a color movie because the imagery and the uh, the glow that black and white gives it, and I'm just wondering as it relates to the picture here, well, which um, one is your favorite, the color or the black and white? I have a tough time with that one. That's why you have both of them. <laughs> um, but that's why I chose both yes, of them. Yeah. My, people think of my work as documentation. And I really am trying to say something about the mills with each photograph. And I find black and white to be a much more malleable uh, medium to work in for expressing feeling and emotion. Um, certain images want to be in color. The image you've just pulled up over there needs to be in color. But uh, um, if it doesn't need color, sometimes you can take it a lot further, do more things with sure. it in black and white than you can in color. This image here, I just want to get it out uh, of my mouth before we change images. Yes. Reminds me of like the uh, the old Torrington Company building. That right? is in Torrington. It is, matter matter but fact, this is a different, a different That is company. right across from where the old copper mill was in Torrington, which is now the Stop and Shop Plaza, but that was the Hendy Tool Company, part of Brass Valley. They made uh, precision industrial lathes. Um, and if people go to the Historical Society in Torrington, they can actually see a whole exhibit on the Hendy Company, including some of that equipment that they made and uh, photographs within the, pro the factories. There you go. Uh, Brass Valley, the fall of an American industry. Uh, Emery Roth II, uh, Ted Roth joining us here. Uh, the book uh, published by uh, Schiffer Books. Uh, for more information, the website www.rothphotos.blogspot.com. Um, you referred to uh, um, these tracks that you took in the book and um, uh, the buildings, some uh, that you obviously, uh, many, all of them that you dealt with uh, abandoned as a magical mystery tour. I mean, I think you touched upon that, what, what a kind of a, a adrenaline rush this is but well it's it's it is always an adventure when you go into a new place that you don't know and what what are you going to find um, I find the best photographs come on the second third fourth and fifth visit but the first visit is the one that uh, um, you're most uncertain about sure. and, and is most exciting 
Now, what do we have here? Obviously, it looks like an this old is, factory, kind of the receiving This is the working ground. brass mill. Um, the portion of it in, in Ansonia that was working was the casting shop. That is the um, powerhouse, which powered the whole complex. And uh, the casting shop is um, right off about where I'm sitting in relation to that now. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that struck me too in these photos, um, and again, I'm, I'm sure it sometimes takes many hours to get the shot, is just how remarkable that the uh, the cloud formation. It, it, it in so many of these shots, as I was reviewing the book, it just um, it almost feels like you're in like a, a, a dream sequence, you know, or kind of like. Uh, again, I, I you see say I the see, nicest thing. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and they're not written down too. But no, seriously, <laughs> they're, they're just you know, uh, you must have spent hours trying to get the, the you know the right. Well, for me, for me, the fun of photography is getting the composition right first. And uh, yes, having a good sky is important, and knowing how you can take that sky and develop it beyond what is naturally there is is valuable to me as well. Do you find that, um, again, it, I guess it depends on what you're photographing. I've seen some other books you've mm -hmm. done where you've done farms and different things. Do you find that you prefer you know, bright sunlight or do you rather like it when it's maybe a little overcast or is it hard to say depending on the, the sun? Most, the most boring thing to me is those days when there is nothing in the sky but blue. What I look for is nice cloud formations. I don't mind overcast. I like texture in the sky. I love atmosphere, fog and smoke, and anything that lets you see the distance, measure the distance, because it, it is in the middle. Here's a shot. I think we saw an image of it earlier. I'm going to just hold it over here if we can get this shot, Jay. Uh, again, uh, you spoke a little bit about this before. Again, uh, to me, when I saw this shot again, it just blew me away because, you know, we have today uh, OSHA. You know, uh, people think of you know 21st century. You know, hard hats and safety glasses, and oh, you got to wear this. You got to wear that. I mean. What were people in 1802? I mean, uh, there there had been a low um, life expectancy rate, not to mention accidents and things that were going on in, in these factors throughout the country worldwide, not just in the, the United States. It's hard to me. It's hard for me to think of a time when I went into a working mill and met people where they didn't talk to me about the accidents that occurred even more recently than that in these factories. They were dangerous places. What you're looking at there is the priming of the furnace and the furnace in the casting house where they poured the metal into three ton billets. Um, was probably the most dangerous place there was. Um, they were very hesitant about us being in there, and we just got bolder and bolder as we got used to it and got to know the routine. But what they're doing there is priming the furnace, which is starting it fresh, which they only do every several weeks because they have to run it 24-7. It's too expensive to have to shut it down each night. So even if they have no metal to cast, no jobs to cast, they're going to keep that furnace running as long as they can until the next jobs come in and it has to be supervised. Once they shut it down, then they have to prime it and that's what they're doing there. And it makes a gush of flame that goes 40 feet up and it seemed like it was going to singe the roof off the building. And I tried to photograph it two times and the light was just too bright and the darkness around it too dark. I came out with nothing. And I got that photo on the third time I managed to get the there when they were priming, and I'm glad I did because sure. it was the last time they primed the furnace. This shot here in the center gang, uh, we've got a clock, and again, um, obviously the, some decay is set in, but I mean, talk about time standing still. And again, these are not exactly <laughs> these are not exactly like ideal conditions. You look like here, like you know, the place hasn't had a good cleaning. And I know this building probably might be abandoned for many years, but I get the impression that I don't think the clock face was ever cleaned, even when they no. were in operation. No, and I love photographing old clocks. That one actually is in the same uh, factory complex as that casting shop, and uh, seeing that clock kind of locked in where. Clearly, some workers had once used it to uh, know when they had to start and finish. And um, I think you have that upside down. There we go. We'll try so that. Nobody else will know. <laughs>
I was, I was, it was a 50-50 shot. I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't sure. What about this one here? What do we this have? This is going also on here? in the in the Farrell Foundry, um, and we're kind of looking up into a catwalk catwalk structure that that rose beyond where I could see up into the rafters, but the stairs were all rusted away and there was no way I could get up there and no matter how much I wanted to get up and see what was up there and walk around and see what photographs could be made, it just couldn't be done. And now if I recall, memory serves, this is beautiful downtown Waterbury, It absolutely correct? is. Right. Um, and, and the uh, right here, is uh, what used to be the Holmes, Booth, and Hayden's lamp works. And uh, that is where they took the three-ton billets that were cast in Ansonia, and they ran them through a World War II era extruder, you know, and through 1900, 1905 benches that, that uh, worked the tube further. They were make, using this ancient equipment to make tube for the nuclear submarines in those buildings. While we have that shot, yeah, uh, uh, there's a mention in the book and I wanted to bring it out because again, I had a, an opportunity, I wanna say early, early to mid 80s, I think while it was still functioning, uh, you mentioned um, in the book um, a marvelous place uh, that itself is kind of in semi-ruins, although I think there is some revival going on. Uh, Holy Land in Waterbury, yes. which uh, began in 1956, uh, headed by a gentleman named uh, John Greco, if I'm uh, correct. And uh, tell tell the, the, the folks a little bit about what what or what is Holy Land in terms well, of the- Holy Land was a project of uh, the community in the South End. Um, John Greco, I guess, organized it. He was a lawyer, I understand, and they built a miniature, miniature Jerusalem in Bethlehem on the top of Pine Hill. And by the 1960s, um, they tell me that it was bringing 40,000 visitors a, a year to, to Waterbury. And um, the ruins of it are still there. It, it ran down for many years. Um, they've now cleared off the top. They've restored the old cross yeah, that was built which there. Which you can see, anyone who ever drives on uh, Route 8 or uh, or Route 84 or pretty much even before the yeah. crossroads. I think usually uh, you can see it when you're heading northbound. Yeah, I need to uh, correct myself. Sure. Not re restored, but replaced the cross. Oh, the cross, yeah. yes, yes. And I believe, um, am I not correct? It, it, they, they have it so that it's uh, lit up even more brightly yes. than before. Yes. And again, it's just a, it's a, you know, a thing that just kind of makes you take notice. You know, it's a, a wonderful thing and quite an endeavor. And then he got with age uh, to the point then when he passed away. And it fell into disrepair. And I think it's interesting that it was restored because the people of Waterbury wanted it restored. And while I'm sure a part of that was, was religious uh, fervor and religious belief that people wanted the cross there, I think part of it also was that it gives identity the, to the place. Sure. And in a world where every place is beginning to look like any place, People want to hold on to those distinctions of place. We can go here to the center shot. I just wanted to point out, if you look in the right-hand corner up top, you see a fan. Now, why am I saying that? You see hose on a more modernistic hose reel, similar to one I know I've used in my day. Fire extinguisher. Uh, the reason I bring this up is that danger you, cadmium. Exactly. That you've got items here that, again, in 1802, in 1902, I highly doubt that there was these kind of things there, at least not set up to look as more modern as yeah. it was. I can only imagine that's probably where the term sweatshop came from. Yeah. This, these places must have been hellacious from a temperature standpoint, uh, not to mention That danger. was the casting house, yeah. which we spoke about before, as is this. This is the casting house now that everything's been removed from it. This is the casting house empty. Uh, there, the uh, fellow there is actually cutting the old machinery Basically apart to salvage operation. Yes, yeah, scrap but, um, operation. Yes, um, it was the most dangerous place by far. You talked, and again, I, I recall this vividly during your your talk that I uh, uh, got to see when when you and I first met. Was again that you uh, in undertaking this book. You are more photographer than author, meaning that you did not set out, as you said in the talk, you're not just rattling out facts and figures because you are not a historian on the subject. You are encompassing what you've learned 
and letting the photographs, in effect, tell really the whole story. The photographs inspire the writing, and I've been a writer all my life. Right. Um, I love to write as much as I love to take pictures, but um, using the photos as writing prompts, I found a very effective way. I, I don't have the ability to, to sustain a long narrative, but um, this book is filled with lots of short stories. Okay. Um, you discuss in the book about um, perhaps what could have been done looking back uh, over the many years to uh, salvage, restore, retrofit some of these uh, classic structures into other uses. We talked about certainly the structures in the smaller towns like the mm -hmm. opera houses, the city halls. There's one we're going to see later where one of the buildings that was an office structure became part of now the Waterbury government office. Mm -hmm. But those were being used for non-manufacturing process. In the case of structures like what we're looking at during the hour today, Again, what what really, you know, and many of them could not be necessarily cleaned up and turned into condominiums or, or shopping malls. They pretty much had to come down in order to establish anything. Well, like I think it, it varies depending on the on the buildings. Right. There are the uh, Fowl buildings that were just recently vacated um, are probably in pretty good condition, and I hope they'll find a way to repurpose those. The old foundry is... Um, even if it could have been saved once, it's, it's so deteriorated now that it can't. But the uh, old Seth Thomas building in Thomaston is now renting floor space and is a, um, a, a working building. And it's a beautiful grandfather clock of a building that it's good as it has been preserved. In, to in Torrington, I know they've restored buildings. In Winstead, they've restored buildings. In a number of the towns, mm -hmm. they've found ways to save even the old factories. The problem, of course, is nobody knows what they're getting into, what the pollution is, until they get in there and try and remove it. You talk in the book about, and again, this obviously, uh, especially with today's standards, I know there's, there's a lot of talk uh, more so than ever these days about you know environmental concerns you know pro and con but i definitely got the impression that you know the rivers and streams around these areas were were highly polluted as a result of uh, you know the the waste and the sludge and the chemicals that were being dumped into into these uh, these rivers and streams the, the standard story that seems to be told in almost every town is in waterbury it's one mill in ansoni it's another other mill who you could tell what they were doing that day by the color of the river. Right. And one of the things I talked about was the amusement park they built at High Rock. And finally, in, in 1905, the railroad closed the amusement park because they said the river smelled too bad. But the river has been fully restored, and it's a, it's a beauty of a river. And people ought to explore it uh, for, for sports uses, for hiking along it. Um, but would you agree that had even even 30 percent of the industry if for whatever reason had remained if the scovels of the world and so many others hadn't left that that there would have had to have been some give and take as far as the 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 cleanliness of the rivers well i think they had begun yeah. but the problem is they didn't begin until about 1960 there i'm told there was absolutely no pollution control on the naugatuck river before then 1960 that's yeah. extraordinary so this this was a river like, like the river in Ohio that could have caught on fire. Sure, yeah. Um, I know uh, some uh, friends and relatives, uh, by the way, this is the building we spoke of earlier, which again was part of, was almost like a business office or whatever. Well, actually, across from that yeah. is... That's the one in Waterbury yes. that now is part the, of the we're government. We're standing building. in front yeah. of the old Chase building, right. which is now government offices. We're lo looking at the city hall. Oh, okay, gotcha. And they were My both mistake. designed as a, a by the same architect and clearly with the same vision of creating a space there. That, and because, that, uh, again, that was not being used as a foundry or other type of right, mill work, they right. were able to retrofit that into, uh, again, suitable uh, housing or, or office space, uh, et cetera. Uh, we're here with um, Emery Roth II, Ted Roth, joining us here for the hour on Studio 411. The book, Brass Valley, The Fall of an American Industry, again, by uh, Schiffer Books. Uh, for more information, the website, www.rothphoto.blogspot.com. 
Um, and we talked about, again, uh, some buildings perhaps that uh, might uh, make some nice condominiums. Uh, here's one that would give you an impression of some that I've seen throughout the state, not, not necessarily in That's the uh, Naugatuck Valley. That's and that one is actually still a working factory. Okay. Um, I say I photographed the last brass mill, but that may be the last brass mill in truth. It's just much, much smaller. And now uh, they specialize in a particular type of product? Uh, um, I hadn't gotten permission to photograph in there. I do have permission to photograph now and intend to. What, they, what I saw when I peeked in was, was small pipe that they were making, okay. but um, I'll learn more about so that with the in the future. with the next book, then we'll have some, we'll <laughs> definitely have some photographs. Uh, I, I'm trying to think, did we cover this last one here? This one I, I just found interesting, if we can get a shot of this, the, uh, again, the tools, and again, a black and white image, and again, also you've got a situation where uh, you're not seeing a lot of shiny polish here because of the fact that, again, the, the working environment is, again, conducive to a lot of soot, dirt, dust. Um, I, I don't think it's just a, a collection of, because of the uh, stuff being abandoned. I think these guys, as you saw in the cover here, the gentleman who we'll talk uh, about in a little bit, you can see that this was not, uh, you know, a clean, clean work that these people did here. I mean, it just boggles my mind what, what they must have been, uh, you know, inhaling and exposing themselves to but we'll get a little bit more on that. Um, reaction of people who worked on some of these sites that you got to meet either in some of the remaining uh, factories or maybe some that you spoke to that said, hey, I worked at this place or I worked at that place. What, what was some of the reaction to uh, well, you it, doing this project? In the working mills, um, the men I met couldn't be more gracious in wanting to tell me about what they did, show me the equipment, explain what they did. They all had tremendous pride in what they were doing, whatever they were doing. Um, and many of them became friends. Uh, I'm still in contact with some. Um, one of the pleasures of having written the book and now taking it around the state in slide talks that I do at libraries or wherever they, they want me, um, is I get to meet people who worked in the mills or the family of people who worked in the mills. And it's very satisfying to find that the pictures resonate and, and speak to them of the world that sure. they knew. As I said there, it was, uh, it was like being exposed to a world of Connecticut that I know Sure, you knew about factories, and you know even even in Fairfield County, there's many there that uh, that you you now hear names of, and you say, oh, that street uh, must be named after uh, after this individual, or or like for instance, uh, in your book, you talk about David Humphreys, okay? And I mm -hmm. remember in Derby, a David Humphreys Road, mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden it starts to click. Now, do people take the extra step to then Google or look up in a in a, a book and say, well, let me find out a little bit more about this? And per people should know yes, what perhaps no. Yeah. People should know what David Humphreys did sure. in Seymour. It was a very important innovation. I love this this center photo here. No smoking. That must have been a later shot because I uh, something tells me in 1802, 1902, yes. 1942, probably smoking was the rage. Yeah, I didn't do much photography, especially in the break room. But help! I didn't please. do much photography in 1802. But it yeah. also says, please help keep this lunchroom clean. Yes, and uh, I, I don't know. I, it, certainly uh, a little different than. The, than what you uh, what you see now in many uh, office and in factory environments. Uh, again, uh, just marvelous. Uh, uh, again, just the, the architecture. Again, as someone who obviously studied it, your 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 family is is rich in, in architectural uh, knowledge and history. I just find you know these these photos uh, you know really breathtaking. That you know the the amount of work that went in. Mm -hmm. These were not as you said built to last. 50 years. These these were built to last, Absolutely. you know, a lifetime. The back corner that we're looking into, I suspect, was in place before the Civil War. The building, the buildings keep changing, and it's a sign of the vitality of the industry that they keep changing, and that each of these factory complexes is a kind of patchwork because the jobs keep changing, and if they get a new order, well, how do we configure for that? Uh, a historical fact that I learned, and again, I learned it right here in the book, Brass Valley, The Fall of an American Industry, that until 1879, youngsters, 
Connecticut had two state capital locations, Hartford and New Haven. So I, a lifelong <laughs> resident of Connecticut, did not know that. And it took someone who, uh, correct me, you were born in New York? I was born, you were in, born New in New York. You were born in New York. It took a New Yorker <laughs> to, to educate me on that. I, I just. Uh, it's, it's always good to come with ignorance. Uh, you have something to fill. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There well, is a wonderful display in our capital, or there used to be, about the two the New Haven and the Hartford Capitals, but in the Capitol building in Hartford today. There's another shot again, uh, uh, just on, on what appears to be a bright day, a clear day, or well, clear in the sense uh, to, to capture a shot. But again, I, I marvel at the uh, not, you know, clear blue sky, which, you know, for baseball, people like clear blue sky. As you said, for photographers, no. That's that's the bane of your existence. Yes. You want you want uh, you know a little a little something else going on up there to kind of uh, contrast. You can read the whole history of Ansonia in that picture. Just knowing what those buildings are, you can follow the whole history of the town right there. Interesting. Here's the, the uh, stat I was looking for before. Connecticut has approximately one million square feet of empty factory space, and and. Here's a state that uh, certainly is having its uh, share of uh, fiscal troubles. And again, it just is amazing to me that uh, 100 million square feet of empty factory space, and in many cases, uh, again, just like sometimes with, with housing in this state, and, and Connecticut's not alone in this, sometimes buildings, as you, as you know well, and, and even I think mm -hmm. that one in Bristol, uh, since you put this book out, there was there was a structure that caught fire a few months ago before we taped, and I remember thinking, oh, I've got to remember to to mention that to you because uh, again, it was another abandoned mm -hmm. factory, perhaps not as well known as these, but again, and one just recently in Waterbury, just about three weeks ago. There you go. So again, it just you know sometimes you just want to say, uh, but I say this more with with housing structures, either mm -hmm. do something about it or knock it down. Mm -hmm. and, and because some of these two, three family homes, it's not like there's anything really almost important to preserve unless they're in a, a certain area of town that maybe is noteworthy. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, it just it, it takes an act of God almost to get the, either the the uh, property renovated or to get it knocked down because it becomes an eyesore and a, and a safety hazard. I will say that I made a return trip to my alma mater in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I visited Homestead and the steelworks there. And even the old workers' housing that was uh, very, very modest, um, they were fixing that up and making something of it. So um, much can be made often of, of these old buildings if people would care for them. And they, the materials they were built of were meant to last, not to, like today's materials. A uh, quote from uh, the book uh, by a gentleman named Doug Thompson. Doug is an adventurer and founder of North Face. Uh, quote, the best journeys are those in which you ask questions you didn't know you had when you started. And I think that certainly is uh, indicative of uh, what you found yourself in. And, and I think in any other work you do is that you just, it's not like a wedding photographer. Oh, let me, you stand here, stand there, boom, and okay, I don't care whether the light's that great. Next, this, this is uh, truly uh, artwork. I have to ask in this, in this shot here, if we can get a, a shot here, th that structure, how high does that rise? I mean, it looks I like would endless. Guess. 30, 40 feet, something like that. This is the uh, one of the machine shops that was still running in Farrell. It's now been closed down. The fate of this building remains to be seen. This is one that's worth preserving. But you could see he was working on a long um, part for a machine there that, uh, and that was um, the kind of machine that makes other machines. Those machines are very special because they're all hand built. And we used to build those in, those in this country. We don't build them here so sure. much anymore. And speaking on that note, uh, a shot here that, that I chose, because again, uh, uh, it kind of brings us back to uh, a lot of what's going on today in, in this country, again, is uh, here's a, a, a piece of structure, probably that from a building that was being torn they down. Were, but, but if you look carefully, you see, again, the pride that was taken, even with structures that probably were 30, 40 feet up in the air. Mm -hmm. There's a USA 
you know, emblazoned on that piece, just like you would uh, probably shoehorse a, uh, you know, a piece of cattle, you know, branded, branded. That was part of a crane rail that was in the uh, extrusion mill that I call the last machine, that extruder. And that's part of the next book, maybe. Um, you, you mentioned about um, American Brass in uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. Again, uh, staggering numbers. At one point, uh, quote, thousands uh, once worked here. Now there are, are fewer than 100. And, I, uh, and now there me, are none. Now there are none because since you did your work, now that, that uh, has closed. Yes. But again, imagine. Uh, thousands, so you know, two, three, four. Again, I don't have the number, but just compare that to what it eventually was down to. Uh, and uh, uh, you American Brass was the largest brass manufacturer in, in the world. Wow. And again, would you think that of those hundred that eventually were left, or fifty, whenever they had closed, how many of those those gentlemen probably worked there for years, probably generations? You know, just the. Uh, they were, there was a variety of people, and, and as a matter of fact, among them were, was one young fellow who worked there beside his father. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, and sadly, the, no, no other generation to follow in their, in their footsteps, whether there was mm -hmm. or not, but certainly was not, not even given the opportunity. Again, we talked before, uh, OSHA, hard hats, safety glasses, ventilation, AC. Again, I, 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 don't, I don't see a lot of that uh, you know, going on back in, back in those early years. So again, it just would be amazing to know what exactly the uh, health implications on many of the uh, hundreds and thousands of men and women uh, that worked in, in these, uh, in these uh, situations. And all of those health regulations and all of those accommodations were part of the culture that we built over that time. That's part of what's, what we're losing. Here's a, a shot too, again, the, the image of black and white, and uh, again, the light coming through. Uh, again, I'm not sure whether that's light that perhaps uh, because of decaying roofs or just the way the light sun hits it. through the decaying roof yeah. that is being caught by smoke that is coming from the opposite corner of that shed where they are removing the last machine, the, a giant extrusion press, the largest ever made in New England. And yeah, we can get a shot of this center shot here. Again, you look at it, I mean, it almost looks like someone's about to get beamed up any moment now. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, you know, a wonderful shot, again, of, uh, uh, I, I'm trying to remember, I think uh, comments that various people have made, uh, not necessarily that worked in these buildings, but just, you know, uh, on, on your Facebook page and, and other sites that I saw. Again, just almost thought of it almost like as if it was an eerie situation, but really, you know, you, you, you don't look at it as like ghostly. You look at it in a different, in a different way, you know, that uh, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, a testimony to what, uh, you know, what these I look uh, at it people. and I try and see what happened there before and the people who were there and the history that was there. Sure, absolutely. Um, impact of the 55 flood. Obviously, I was not around. I know I've spoken to people like, uh, especially uh, down in the Collinsville area, but certainly Torrington, Winstead. I, I read up on my uh, history a little bit of how, uh, you know, it impacted that, um, that area greatly. And obviously that uh, added to perhaps the uh, later exodus of many of these uh, companies. Almost every factory building along the river has a mark as to how, how high the flood waters got. And that building with the light coming in that we were just looking at, the mark there is about 20 feet up the wall. Wow, 20 feet, all yeah. the, the water marks. Yeah, yes. I remember you talking about that. And it's back that. from yeah. the river. It's not right at the river. Yeah, yeah, and again, just to impact it. Another thing too, quickly, and we're looking at, I believe what's at the Seth Thomas building. That's the correct? Seth Thomas yeah. building. Again, a wonderful shot. Now, uh, that obviously looked like it was taken in kind of uh, maybe uh, almost twilight, uh, later, uh, later yes. early evening, later afternoon. Yes, there's a, there's a wonderful time for taking pictures that lasts 15 or 20 minutes, just as the sun has gone down in the sky and the buildings all get to the same tonality before the sky gets really dark. And it's a time when you can suddenly catch the sky and the exterior and the interior lights all at once. I wanted to mention in the remaining moments we have here with uh, 
Emery Ted Roth uh, on uh, Studio 411. Again, the book Brass Valley, The Fall of an American Industry. In 2016, um, you uh, were involved uh, uh, as part of a book called Seeing in Sixes, uh, Six Image Projects from Lens Work Readers. Uh, and again, there's a section here, uh, The Dressmaker's Daughter. And again, uh, I know we can't see it in, in clear uh, clarity there, but again, there's the Ansoni Opera House, and there's about uh, five other photos to that, All in uh, the Ansonia Opera House, and um, it was a challenge to make a six-photo essay, to yeah. use just six photos to tell a story, sure. and that's what that is. There you go. So again, that's, a, that's another, uh, another one that Ted has been a part of. Again, um, this book here, again, the, the um, uh, re response, the reception, uh, especially here in the state of Connecticut, is, uh, I assume has been, uh, certainly from your, your talks, your lectures, has been uh, uh, more than you could have hoped for. I think you've been very, been very, very pleased. very satisfying yeah. to me. Yeah, very good. And, and again, uh, uh, the, these great images as well, too. Uh, uh, for more information on uh, Ted's work, uh, www rothphoto.blogspot.com and uh, people have asked you quote uh, what do you find there to photograph well, I guess referring to when you go to different uh, different locales your answer quote I photograph what's gone yeah, yeah very good very good and uh, again, just uh, uh, you know, marvelous, marvelous work. And uh, we thank you for uh, spending some time with us and, uh, and sharing your, uh, not only your book, but your images and uh, sharing some of the knowledge and the technique and uh, keep up the good work. And we hope you'll, uh, you'll come back and share more work with us as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, thank Very you good. for having me. Uh, my pleasure. Ted Roth, Emery Ted Roth II, uh, joining us, a photographer, uh, author, uh, the book again, Brass Valley, The Fall of an American Industry uh, by uh, Schiffer Publishing. Uh, and again, uh, the uh, website for more information, uh, some beautiful photos that can be seen as well, www.rothphoto.blogspot.com. Uh, we have uh, reluctantly come to uh, the end of another hour of Studio 411. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed the program as much as we have uh, uh, bringing it to you uh, today. And we look forward to seeing you again on another episode of the program. I hope you have a great uh, week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks.